live button. So everybody be Facebook sensitive. Don't say anything crazy on Facebook, okay? Um, it's still winding up, so give me two more seconds. And then I'd like to introduce our panelists and guest speakers. And then I will load up a 15 minute video presentation that I gave at the Society, you know, the Sexual Medicine Society of America, of North America. Um, and we'll watch that. And during that time, please use the chat feature to um, send in your comments, um, uh, suggestions and questions. And as soon as that presentation is done, we'll go back to our panelists and we'll just keep it completely open and just answer all the questions that we have. We have a few topics that we definitely want to cover and I'll help direct that together with Sue. Um, so uh, I'm really excited. This is based on previous request that we have more time for Q&A instead of us just talking all the time. And I've already said it once before, I have no idea what they're talking about. Okay, so let me start out with introducing our panelists. So I want to do the following, bear with me. Can you just double check that that's okay? All right, so um, I think everyone already knows Dr. Erwin Goldstein. He's like my mentor, my role model, and the person that opened my eyes to this problem, uh, dealing with uh, spinal abnormalities that affects the pelvic organs, together with Dr. Barry Komizrak, who is a neurophysiologist and a very smart person from Rutgers University, has a PhD, and is the kind of hardcore science, neuroscience part of our team. You have me, who's kind of like, I'm the checker players. They're the chess and go players, but I'm the spine surgeon that deals with the small group of people where pelvic problems are due to the spine. And because of this topic, we also brought in Dr. Michael Vertolin, one of my uh, favorite pain colleagues in town, who's very familiar with all the state of the art kind of uh, non-surgical pain modalities to treat pelvic pain. And he'll be a good resource to talk about how we do diagnostics, et cetera. So um, start thinking about questions for uh, the panel, um, and we'll go from there. So I want to escape this, and I want you guys to watch this one video of mine. And don't make fun of me, because sometimes I can say some goofy things. So I want to sh stop share. And then share one more time. So we have 15 minutes. Um, please use the chat box. It's a little on the bottom strip of your of your um, Zoom box. You'll see the, the, the uh, something that says chat. If you click on that and you can start typing questions, I'll start looking at that. We'll all do that while we play the video. Hi, I'm Dr. Kim from San Diego, California. I'd like to thank doctors. Al can you just check on your end? Yeah. Is there sound? No. Oh. Focusing on PGAD. Here are my disclosures. I'd like to thank my uh, co author, as well as Sue Goldstein. You know. The San Diego Spine Sexual Medicine Can Program is a multidisciplinary group. About every two weeks or so, we get together and review cases. Dr. Komizrak joins us virtually. Um, and we basically go over patient histories, exam findings, prior uh, testing, prior treatments, and review relevant imaging studies. And as the spine surgeon in the group, I have a relatively easy job. I basically have to ask one, is it possible that these disorders may be coming from the lumbar sacral spine? And if so, is there a surgically treatable lesion? And finally, is that surgery reasonable in the context of the overall condition? So what are lesions that are treatable and not treatable? Let me give you an example. This would be a non-treatable lesion because this is essentially a normal looking MRI. In other words, with the current technology, we cannot discern any significant abnormalities also not treatable are abnormalities like this, which are so severe, a surgery to treat this problem is so large and so dangerous 
that I would consider this at the current state a not treatable lesion. So what are treatable lesions? Here are the things that we tend to see frequently. Disc protrusions, annular tears, and relatively small tarlop cysts. We've been collaborating since 2015, so we now have a fair amount of experience. Since 2015, we've evaluated almost 900 patients. And from those 900 patients, we've identified about 300 patients that seem to have reasonably treatable lesions. And we've recommended that they pursue a targeted diagnostic injection. Of those, um, almost half decide to proceed with the injection, and we have positive diagnostic results and negative diagnostic results. And usually, it's a positive diagnostic result that leads toward a recommendation toward surgery, but not always. And from those 900 patients to date, we've done about 70 surgeries. And this is surgeries of all types related to sexual medicine. Two thirds of them are Three quarters of them are in the hypersensitivity category, PGAD slash GPD being a hypersensitivity disorder, and a quarter are uh, hyposensitivity disorders such as PDOD or anorgasmia and such. Now, we've been assessing this overall group uh, with a general patient reported outcomes measure that we call PGII. It stands for Patient's Global Impression of Improvement, and it's simply the patient telling us their response to the surgery overall as a simple seven-point Likert scale vector. So looking at the entire group of 70 patients, this is a mixed smash of all different types of patients with sexual disorders coming through the San Diego Spine Sex Med program. If you look at that overall, 67% of these patients had some degree of improvement, either Likert scale one, two, or three on the PGII response. And keep in mind, that is a group of patients that have had multiple treatments prior to this without success. If you want to be a little bit more stringent and just ask what percentage of patients have a PGII score of one or two, in other words, they're significantly very much better or much better, that would be 42%. Of course, like all surgeries, not every surgery goes well. Some patients do not get any better, and 9% of patients did get somewhat worse. Now, from that group, we've done 20 surgeries on patients with PGAD slash GPD treated using a single procedure, having essentially a single diagnosis, either a herniated disc or a disc protrusion with an annular tear. And we have an average follow-up of 16 months, ranging from 13 to 37 months. In other words, all these patients have at least one year follow-up. So looking at the PGI response, these are the number of patients that answered in each of those seven-point Likert scales. Now, if you look at this overall, I would say that 80% of those patients hence had some degree of improvement. And being a little bit more stringent, 65% had very much improvement or much improvement. And we noticed that Patients that had a positive diagnostic response, their improvement rate was more closer to 90%. I'd also want to talk about patients with Tarlof cysts and GPD slash PGAD. If you look at this group of patients, there's only seven, but 86% of them have some degree of improvement. Again, very high success rates for spine surgery. And 57% had much improvement. There were 14% that got no better, but no one got worse, and there were no complications. I would like to leave you uh, with some additional information that may be of interest to you, because I have personally learned a lot from performing these surgeries and directly observing the pathologic anatomy uh, of these lesions. These are pictures of an annular tear. This is the MRI. And you probably know that annular tears look relatively benign, and many surgeons view them as an incidental finding because many asymptomatic patients have annular tears. Now, that does not mean that all patients with annular tears are asymptomatic. It just means that they're difficult to find because they're amongst a sea of asymptomatic patients. But 
It's our duty to find that small percentage of patients with annular tears that are symptomatic, especially if it's causing significant symptoms affecting their function and quality of life. And you can do that by doing targeted anesthetic injections relatively easily by using a transforaminal epidural steroid uh, approach. Yes. So during surgery, we do a couple of things. The first is that we do what's called a chromatodiscogram. I enter the disc with a very skinny, thin needle, a 22 gauge spinal needle, and I inject the dye into the middle of the disc, into the nucleus, which is the gel center of the disc, and observe its pattern. And if there's an annular tear, it will leak out the back and stain a little area. And if you can see here closely, you can see a little line coming out and then a halo around the back part of the disc. And more importantly, when I go in there during surgery, first of all, there appears to be a lot of inflammation because the dural tube tends to look very white and blue normally, but in patients with symptomatic annular tears, they consistently look injected like erythema, but on a dural membrane. And the dural membrane has lots of anti-adhesion properties because it's supposed to slide around in the canal as we move around. And many times the dural membrane is adherent to the epidural tissues, especially the posterior longitudinal ligament and the annulus. So all those things reflect a process of inflammation and scarring. Now, when I get to the annular tear, I notice a couple of other things. First, when I palpate it with a probe, when I palpate the annulus, it should be firm like a hockey puck or a car tire, because that's the function of the annulus is it's like a steel delta radial tire. But in patients that do well and are symptomatic, when I palpate on the area of the annular tear, it is like I'm tapping an empty tent. There's a defect underneath. And when I enter the annulotomy defect, that blue dye has stained the nucleus um, as it goes through the annular tear and gets trapped within the posterior annulus. That will often come out like it's pressurized and spontaneously leak out. And you'll notice that there's multiple blue fragments trapped inside the white nucleus. Similarly, when you look at Tarloff cysts, they have an interesting appearance. First of all, the dural tube is also injected and looks inflamed. And more importantly, the, the cyst is not part of the dural membrane. It is inside the dural sac. So when you open up the dural sac, you don't necessarily run into the cyst right away. But here's what you often run into. I don't know if you can see this, but the nerve rootlets are tortuous. We call that the ramen noodle sign. And that's not normal. You can also see how injected the dural membrane is both on the outside as well as on the inside. Now, when I move those nerves over as I release it, you can see the cyst emanating out. So the first thing that I uh, want to emphasize is that a Tarloff cyst isn't like a synovial cyst bulging out the entire dural membrane. It is multiple cysts potentially inside the dural sac, um, and it's not part of the dura matter. It is more likely part of the arachnoid and the pia. So here's the next picture in the sequence. This is the appearance after puncturing that cyst with the tip of a number 11 surgical scalpel, which is a pointed uh, scalpel. And I think you can appreciate how injected everything looks still. And I don't know if you can see this filmy adhesion to all these little nerve rootlets that are having this funny, torturous course. And all these findings to me points toward an abnormal inflammatory process that is occurring there. In addition, I'll often find multiple septations inside the dural sac, and it's almost like a honeycomb pattern of membranes that basically become a one-way check valve, allowing cerebral spinal fluid in, but not out. And as that occurs over time, each of those septations get bigger. They um, cause the nerve to be deflected and take on a, a different pathway and a, eventually a torturous course. And 
as the body realizes that there's something abnormal going on because the pressure along the outer part of the membrane along the periosteum of the sacrum will tell the body that there's something wrong. The body will initiate a healing response, which almost always involves inflammation. So all these findings indicate to me that inflammation is a big part of these abnormalities uh, causing symptoms. In the absence of inflammation, you can have these abnormalities and be asymptomatic. So in summary, it is clear that spinal abnormalities can cause GPD slash PGAD. And most likely this is a complex process involving multiple different causes, but we now know that neurologic causes of GPD are a significant proportion of these cases. And in the process of evaluating and treating these patients, we've discovered that diagnostic injections is really good at predicting surgical results. So a positive diagnostic injection will most likely lead to a very good result surgically if you look at the types of surgeries that we've done. And most importantly, we've noticed that seemingly minor abnormalities, things that we consider as spine surgeons to be incidental findings in asymptomatic individuals. So we have to have a slightly different mindset that there are a group of patients with relatively minor abnormalities that can cause big symptoms. And it's incumbent upon us to identify those patients and treat them at the appropriate time. And obviously a lot more work needs to be done, including developing a, a patient reported outcomes instrument specific for GPD slash PDAD, if one can be made, so that we can very carefully follow these patients' results and keep fine tuning our ability for diagnosis and treatment. With that, I'd like to thank you all for having me today and for your attention. And as always, especially Sue Goldstein, our current fellow, Maria Yuloko, Rose Hartzell, who's our sex therapist extraordinaire, just happens to be in San Diego, our neuro general testing uh, um, technicians, uh, Julie Minton and Catherine Gagnon, and of course, my PA that is in charge of the sex med program in my office, Jennifer Blevins. And of course, our patients who've elected to take this journey with us. Thank you. All right. Um, that seemed like a lot longer than 15 minutes. So thank you for sticking in there. We have a ton of awesome questions. So um, let me start out with one that will involve the entire panel group right away. And that's from one of our favorite colleagues um, who's asking, what are the different ways that we can decrease inflammation in the spine and pelvis to treat these pelvic disorders? So let's just let's uh, go around the uh, table and everyone chime in. Can I start with Dr. Erwin Goldstein, our fearless leader? Mute. First, there you go. So thank you very much. Um, well, we are strong supporters of your surgery, Dr. Kim, because uh, you have developed techniques that are minimally invasive, and I'm sure you will explain that better. And for uh, irritation from a Tarlov cyst that's wound up the nerve or has an annular tear that's irritated the, the duro that has irritated the nerve root, uh, it seems more likely a longer term solution would be by surgery. Having said that, there are people who can't have surgery or have had surgery and only a part of their symptoms have resolved. And I see that one of the individuals on the chat is Sonia. And Sonia is a patient of mine and Dr. Kim's who uh, benefit greatly from less surgery, uh, laser excision uh, surgery. But the, uh, she required an additional strategy with what we call shockwave therapy. So Sonia would lie on her stomach, exposed to us, her low back region, and we would apply a device that emits uh, uh, energy traveling faster than the speed of sound. It's basically a sonic boom. We do three shocks per second. It's about uh, uh, 2,400 shocks takes... Uh, you know, just uh, about 15, 17 minutes. There's really no pain. Uh, uh, if Sonia experienced pain or other patients experienced pain, we would just lower the intensity. 
So the energy is in millijoules per square millimeter, and we typically do 0 0.1 uh, millijoules per square millimeter. Having said all the technical things, uh, you just lie there and get your back shock. And during the process, as Sonia will tell us, and actually Sonia has a, a testimonial video out there if anyone wants to look at it. Uh, you can get, get there on, on uh, YouTube, Sonia Wise testimonial video. And uh, uh, as we're doing the shockwave, her PGAD or her symptoms from the tarlow cyst uh, uh, or annular tear, whatever we're aiming at, uh, will go away. And that's pretty exciting. Um, and then uh, the resolution of the pain will be for various months. Um, and we may have to do more shockwave, but it's a non-invasive way to do this. So that would be my contribution to that question. I gather you're showing some examples of shockwave therapy. Dr. Kim, you're muted right now. Oh, sorry about that. I fell for the oldest trick in the book. I forgot to hit the space bar, uh, bar button. Um, here's some pictures of the shockwave that I found on the internet. Um, I wasn't very well aware of this uh, therapy until recently. Um, is the pain world, um, do they use shockwave therapies for anything? You're asking me? Yes, this is a question for Michael. Yeah, so this uh, kind of falls more into the regenerative medicine side. And so there's sort of a, a blend going on between traditional pain management and regenerative uh, therapies. I mean, the idea here is that there's improved blood flow. We see this also with things like PRP and prolotherapy, where you're where traditionally uh, blood flow poor areas uh, get improved blood flow and inflammatory markers can decrease over time as a result of improved blood flow. Um, and then with PRP, platelet-rich plasma, you're actually introducing growth factors into the area. Um, and so we're seeing this for, for joints and other, other parts of the body as demonstrated here by the shockwave um, therapy device that you're just demonstrating here. Yeah, um, uh, inflammation seems to be such a common a hub of abnormalities. It's part of a critical part of our immune system and our ability to heal uh, injuries and wounds and things like that. But it's such a complex system that it easily goes awry and causes all these kind of chronic pain problems we see all the time, like in the elbow and the shoulder and the heel. Those are all chronic inflammatory problems um, that are multifactorial. So, uh, and, I, and I'm, I'm afraid that with COVID, we're going to start seeing a huge, huge, huge influx of this post-COVID syndrome in folks with chronic pain symptoms uh, developing. That's a very real thing. And that goes to what you're saying about inflammatory processes gone completely awry. We've seen that particularly with COVID. So it's, it's a big deal. And things like fibromyalgia honestly can have come from previous viral infections, particularly in the brain and other areas causing abnormal sensation and that sort of thing as well. So we've, we've actually seen that. Yep. All right, to summarize, I mean, the ways to decrease inflammation. Yes. Uh, you said that um, the, the question was uh, how to treat inflammation. And don't you do that with um, the adrenal corticoid injections? Uh, of course, they don't last uh, for a long time, but that is uh, one treatment for the inflammation, right? Yes. So the epidural steroid injections, that is probably the most direct uh, effort to try to decrease the inflammation at a kind of a lesion in the spine. Right. So, you know, I can speak to that, you know, typically somebody who has sciatica, they may end up going to physical therapy. Their primary doctor may give them what's called a medrol dose pack, which is a bunch of steroids and they're carpet bombing the whole body. Everything's getting carpet bombed with uh, anti-inflammatory effect, which is not a healthy thing to do. So with, with directed nerve root blocks, like uh, Dr. Kim, uh, talked about earlier, those selective nerve root blocks. I can actually put uh, local anesthetic, which calms the pain immediately, but also a small amount of uh, non-particulate steroid, which is like a smart missile going right through the window, right through the door and targeting those exact areas that Dr. Kim described so eloquently under actual visualization. You can see the area is red, it's swollen, it's at inflamed right at that annular junction, right where that material that he was talking about that's in the center of the disc, it's highly inflammatory. 
It's very rich in interleukin two, and it's very, very inflammatory. And we can actually target that with a small amount of steroid and make that go away. Something that's really developing in, my, in, in the pain world is using pulsed radio frequency ablation on the dorsal root ganglion, which calms down cellular transport of inflammatory markers. And it's not a steroid. So steroids work in the initial period, just like everybody was saying, but repeated exposure to steroids are probably not a good thing. So we're always looking for a steroid-free sort of long-term approach. Um, and then, you know, surgery is sometimes the right answer. Uh, sometimes there's things in between. <coughs> yeah, I think the idea with surgery is to create, uh, you know, a different healing environment that allows the uh, healing process to wind up the inflammatory process and then wind it down like a normal healing event. Um, and the idea is that before surgery, the injury went down a path of chronic inflammation that does not know how to turn off and it keeps reiterating itself. And anybody that's had a golfer's elbow, tennis elbow, plantar fasciitis, they know that that, that pain is very intense and lasts for months. Once it gets started, it's self-perpetuating. By going in there and doing surgery and hopefully doing it as minimal invasive as possible, you restart the healing process. It goes down the normal pathway uh, and you're doing a few other things like removing the, the original offending agent, et cetera. But that's the idea of surgery. Um, all right, let's go to another question unless somebody has a burning question about inflammation some more. Um, please put it into the chat. Um, there's a question about, there was a good one. I just forgot it now. <laughs> let's talk about dorsal column stimulator because there's uh, an attendee who has a, a problem where there's multiple things going on and it's clear that you're not gonna be able to just target one lesion necessarily. So one other, another option is to kind of reorganize the way the brain receives pain signals. And that whole strategy um, encompasses something called neuromodulation. That, that's like a spinal cord stimulator, dorsal column stimulators, um, electrical stimulators, um, and I'm talking about the implanted devices. The, the skin devices are called TENS units, but Dr. Bertolin um, is an expert. He's the pain specialist are the ones that put in the implantable trials and a lot of the implantable leads. So can you talk a little bit about, um, about that technology as it relates to pelvic pain? Absolutely. So um, dorsal column stimulators, as you call them, have been around for 50 years. And actually it started about uh, 5,000 years ago when the Mesopotamians realized that you could throw a, an electric eel in with a pregnant lady so that she wouldn't feel anything during delivery. So that's where TENS units sort of came from. And wow. over time, you know, even, even uh, the, the Romans actually wrote about this in 79 AD. So if you had an ache in your foot, go down to the beach and stand on, a, on an electric fish until your leg goes numb. So everybody has had the experience when they have something painful in their knee, let's say they rub it, it feels better. That's because the brain can only pay attention to one thing at a time. And so that was the, the normal thought for the way dorsal column stimulators work. Since then, in the last 10 years, it's been a renaissance. We've sort of figured out, it's not about what you feel or don't feel, but we can interfere with that wind up pain that I think Dr. Uh, Kamisarak was talking about that occurs in the spinal cord when it's constantly irritated, an area called the wide dynamic range neurons. And we can kind of shut that down with stimulation patterns. It's completely different than a TENS unit. Just because a TENS unit doesn't work for you doesn't mean that a stimulator wouldn't work for you. The other, other benefit of these stimulators is it's a try it before you buy it situation. So I can put some trial leads in and you get to experience what it would be like with an implanted device for 10 days without surgery. So it's like an epidural, we just put the wire in. A newer version, which we're seeing here on the left on the screen, is something called dorsal root ganglion stimulation. The dorsal root ganglion is actually where the nerve leaves the spinal uh, canal through the foramen that Dr. Uh, um, uh, Kim was talking about. It's a different part of the spinal cord. And actually, its job is to act as, a, as an arbitrator to say what is pain and what is not pain to go through to the spinal canal. And so this is a newer technology, DRG stimulation, completely different, where we actually put the little wire. If you can show that picture, uh, Dr. Kim, that I sent you by uh, email um, of the actual DRG lead in place, did you? The fluoro, did you the, the fluoro shot? 
Yeah, the floral shot. If you could show that, that'd be great. So that folks can see that that's different than a spinal cord stimulator lead. Um, basically, we can actually target the specific nerve root that's coming out. So I have a, a colleague who published in obstetrics and gynecology. So this is what a DRG lead looks like. You can see it's actually exiting under that little circle. That's called the pedicle. And that nerve root runs right along where those four little contacts are. So I can actually target very specifically the area involved. So for pelvic pain, it happens to be L1 bilaterally and S2 bilaterally for chronic pelvic pain. Um, uh, a colleague of mine, Dr. Kiran Patel, published on this. And while it's still considered off-label, it's become more mainstream as something to be able to do. Um, and we call it causalgia of the, of the pelvis. And so it is, it is a covered benefit. So that's in a nutshell where neuromodulation has gone in the last 10 years. It's really kind of leapfrogged in our understanding of mechanisms and how it works. And so certainly in certain patients, this is a, a definitely an option. Awesome, okay. Um, this, have I have a, a really good question from somebody. We have a question um, from Where is that? We have a, we have a question from New George. Something about um, being anxious or stress makes pelvic symptoms worse. Um, why is that? Maybe we can start with Dr. Komizarek since our, he's our neuroscientist. Why do you think that that, that has that effect? Um, Barry, you have to unmute yourself. I guess one of the possibilities is that um, there's a, uh, a change in the neurotransmitters in the brain with, uh, with stress and um, the, uh, uh, there's uh, a gate, me gate control mechanism that uses uh, serotonin and norepinephrine in the spinal cord. And uh, with, with stress, with the emotional stress, that could change the, uh, the activity uh, of the, uh, the brain control of the spinal cord and allow uh, more uh, uh, adverse sensations to come, come into the brain. So that's just one possibility. I, I, don't, I don't know of any, any real research showing exactly why emotional distress can, can change pet, uh, pain threshold, but maybe Dr. Verlin knows something um, uh, regarding that. It's certainly a reality, but the mechanism, I, I'm not sure anybody knows what the mechanism is. Well, well, clearly, clearly there's a stress reaction going on that actually develops a chronic pain signal. And I already referred to that in the white dynamic range neurons, for instance, that get uh, spun up a wind up phenomenon. We already know that sympathetic wind up actually is involved in things like complex regional pain syndrome, where we, or we've heard of it called RSD in the past or causalgia written about by uh, uh, Silas Weir Mitchell in the, in the Civil War, looking at brachial plexus injuries. I'm former military, so we dealt with a lot of that. So there's a sympathetic component that gets upregulated. And that obviously works in the um, hippocampus and other regions of the brain in terms of connecting emotional state. Um, we even see certain kinds of spinal cord stimulation called burst stimulation affecting what are called the medial pathways. And normally the medial pathway, as you know, is involved in reinforcing negative experience. So pain reinforces negative experience. Negative experience reinforces pain. So there's a cycle there. So we, we have ways of breaking that. So burst stimulation actually stops the medial pathway. It, it actually inhibits uh, some of that signaling to reduce that. So there's an intimate connection. And in pain medicine, we say no brain, no pain, no pain, no brain. So they're, they're intimately related to each other um, in a neurochemical way. So I want to bring up the question that Cliff has. Um, he's asking if there are any MRI abnormalities that correlate specifically with symptoms or if, if there are specifically with surgical success. Does it, does it make a difference? Um, talking about surgery, why don't I answer that? Um, yes and no. In, there's a soft correlation between success in patients that have a hypersensitivity disorder versus a hyposensitivity disorder. So hypersensitivity, hypersensitivity disorder are things like pelvic pain, hyperarousal, um, um, whereas hyposensitivity are numbness, uh, lack of sensation, lack of pleasure, anhedonia, things like that. 
Um, the surgical su success of a hypersensitivity patient have been better in part because we can diagnose those patients better through targeted anesthetic injections. So um, I think that's kind of like a logistical reason why those patients are doing better. Um, but the most important thing is, is that um, a clean diagnostic response is probably the most important predictor of surgical outcomes. And the problem always arises, how do we get a good diagnostic response, especially in patients where their symptoms may come and go without the ability to, to provoke them at will. So if a patient's going through a period of relatively low activities, doing a diagnostic injection will not help that much. Um, and some patients cannot, they have it all the time, but they don't know how to make it worse or better at will. Uh, and that makes diagnosis really difficult. But otherwise, um, we really are just focusing on the diagnostic part of it. And then doing the surgery as minimally invasively and as carefully and gingerly as possible so that we don't create too much collateral damage. Uh, Joel, Joel, can I, can I add something to that? Isn't it the case that uh, if there's a, a herniated disc at say uh, sacral two, uh, then uh, because there are uh, the same dermatomal level of sacral two also carry sensation from the, uh, say the back of the leg and the, uh, and the butt that um, those uh, symptoms can be associated with genital symptoms because the same, same genital sensory nerve, say the pudendal nerve that carries sensation from the clitoris also carries sensation from the back of the leg. Um, and, and from the butt, so uh, for sacral three. So if there's a, in, if, if some uh, inflammation or injury or, or damage to the sacral two root, for example, then not only is there a general pelvic, uh, gen not only say clitoral uh, discomfort, but it could be associated with the back of the leg and butt discomfort because it's the same fight. Yeah, from a clinical standpoint, on, like on a day-to-day -day basis, what you really see on the ground is that there's a lot of cross reactivity between each lumbar level. So people with abnormalities in the sacrum can have back and leg pain and people with lumbar abnormalities can have pelvic or sacral symptoms because the signals, it's like an electrical wire going by a highway and any place in the highway can affect that signal. It just has to also, be in a specific way. I would also add, you know, we're wired to feel where things are on our fingertips with very clean discretion, right? Two millimeter discretion. I know exactly how far on my fingertip is. But you asked me to tell me how many fingertips apart I am on my low back. I'd have to say I, I'm not entirely sure. Anybody who's had abdominal pain from gastric distress will not be able to tell you exactly where the problem is. We're not wired that way. And so, like you said, there's a lot of crosstalk, like a highway. And, and so sometimes you can get what's called referred pain, uh, where it's going, where it feels like it's in this spot. Like we deal with that all the time, right, Dr. Kim? Is it coming from the hip or is it coming from the L4 nerve root? I, I, I don't know which, we have to figure it out. And that's why you said diagnostic blocks are, are the gold standard. If I can eliminate pain with a very specific nerve block on that dorsal root ganglion, I, we know for a fact that surgery is going to make a difference when we do something with it. Yeah. So if we're relying on the, di on the diagnostic block for someone who has hypofunction, they don't have feeling, um, can we do some testing? And maybe Dr. Goldstein, you can address this, some testing in order to determine whether or not the, that um, injection was successful. So thank you, Sue. Uh, oh, yeah. No, I, I, can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Okay, so uh, you're the only one who did that. So um, we have a fabulous test, as Dr. Kim said in his uh, lecture, uh, for people who have hyperfunction. We, we use a, an anesthetic and it numbs it. And if it goes, the pain goes away uh, with an injection locally in the spine at the target region, that gives us the evidence that that's the cause. We don't really have uh, uh, the exact parallel drug to make a nerve work again. If somebody doesn't, if has low sensation in the penis or somewhere, uh, uh, clitoris, uh, labia, genital area, we don't have a drug to, to make the nerve work again. So the best example we do is a steroid injection. Uh, it reduces inflammation and hopefully by reducing inflammation, the nerve can function again. And then the sensation uh, symptoms come back. So we give 
a four hour window in the lidocaine and the hyperfunctioning. And we do a seven, maybe 10 day window for the uh, steroid injection. And Michael, maybe you could comment more about that. With respect to uh, the steroid effect? It, yeah, the steroid effect on being diagnostic, not therapeutic. Yeah. For people who have hypofunction. Yeah, I, I would agree with that because you really can't tell from a local anesthetic perspective, like you said, with hypofunction, you're going to have a, already numbness in the area. So how am I going to make the numbness a, a different kind of numbness? I would say that sometimes people do have numbness uh, that's painful and the diagnostic block with the local anesthetic actually changes the perception of numbness. So I'm not going to say that that's not entirely a useful option, but certainly the steroid effect um, if you do get, if you get no benefit from the local anesthetic portion, we give them a diary and it says they didn't do anything, but two or three days later, they're feeling better, then we can infer that the steroid portion did do something. So that's, that's the way I would interpret that. Thank you. So we have another interesting question. Um, why can't we get tarlepsis disease when it's severely symptomatic classified as a spinal cord injury? Um, she goes, patient person goes on to ask, I feel like mine is the is same symptoms as Cotaquinas syndrome between, uh, I won't go up further, but is, is there any consideration that this is considered spinal cord issue, injury? Yeah, I think the, I think the issue is nomenclature, which means how we name things. So the spinal cord actually ends at L1 and at, or L2, depending on the person. And it becomes all just the peripheral nerves or the Cotaquina that then go out to your arms and legs. So, um, you know, a tarlopsis is affecting the peripheral nerve. So you can't call it a spinal cord injury. You could call it a nerve injury. You can call it a cotyquina syndrome, kind of. Um, it's really not the cotyquina, but I don't think it'll help that much to change whether or not it's a spinal cord injury other than change the benefits. It won't really help us treat patients any differently. Did you guys agree with that? Agree. Okay, I saw another really good question, but I forgot it again. So if there's any questions that people have not, that we've not answered, please type it back in one more time so I can easily can find it. We have so many things in the chat, up. I can't keep up. Can I, can I address the question that those. came up uh, from Lucy Pawak to everybody? She says, uh, are we concerned that the FDA has not approved the use of epidural steroid injections also for those with connective tissue disorders, epidural steroid injections are contraindicated from my understanding. There's also literature findings that ESIs may contribute to adhesive arachnoiditis. Are they worth the risk? Well, this is a loaded question. So first <laughs> of all, a lot of the things that we do in medicine are what we call off-label because it takes forever for uh, a study to be submitted with, uh, with, uh, with that sort of peer review level required for the FDA to say something is on-label. So the truth of the matter is all epidural steroid injections are technically off-label. Some steroids are worse than others. They have uh, uh, preservatives in them. I avoid the use of anything with, with preservatives in them. Uh, also for targeted nerve roots, we try to avoid particulate steroids um, so that we don't have some of the things happen that you're describing here. Um, it really, the issue that you're reading about was with triamcinolone. Um, and so that actually has a label box on it saying not for use in the epidural space. But other ones don't say that at all. So, you know, even gabapentin being used for neuropathy is technically off label because Pfizer never went and spent $50 million or $100 million to get a label indication for that. So let's be very careful about what the FDA says is approved and not approved. Yeah, I think the key is that there's a difference between off label and contraindicated. Off label exactly. just means it's not specifically FDA approved uh, for use in that specific, for that specific reason. Taking a baby aspirin every day is off-label use versus contraindication means that we as a group of physicians have collaborated, uh, have decided together in a collaborative way um, that that's a bad idea. Um, so having doing something that's contraindicated is a big deal. Doing something off-label, we do that all the time. So it's right. important to and, be and aware so of to answer that question, ESIs are not contraindicated right. for connective tissue disorders. Let me just we, be we've been, about that. Yeah, we'd have a lot of trouble if we couldn't do epidural steroid injections in terms of evaluating yeah. for and caring for our patients. So and, and in fact, in, in the UK, the NICE, it's called the National Service Health Service, 
called NICE, isn't anything but NICE. They decided to get rid of epidural steroid injections for a couple of years, and the rate of back surgery went up 400%, and people on opioids went up 500%. So they decided, hey, that's a really bad idea. We need to keep uh, epidurals in our armamentarium. They're not the end-all and be-all, like I said. We don't want to be doing steroid injections ad nauseum for 20 years. They cause osteoporosis. They have other issues that, 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 that occur. But as a tool, uh, they are most definitely uh, useful and standard of care. Well, Joel, there's a bunch oh. of questions on Tarloff says surgery technical. Uh, someone has a wide neck and then Tarloff says someone wants to know what you do in the minimally invasive sphere. Why don't you spend a few seconds on that? Okay, um, that is one of those situations is like, how would you play a par five hole? <laughs> I would say it depends on the par five. It's, if it's long, if it's a dog lick. So um, I think the easiest thing to do is to take a look at your sacral MRIs to see what the personality of that cyst is um, and see if it's reconstructable. It's always possible. I think what that surgeon is saying is that it's probably too dangerous for, for you and the symptoms that you're having. That's my guess because there's very few surgeries that we cannot do. It's just, there's a lot of surgeries that we shouldn't be done because of the risk benefit ratio. So um, I've never heard that. It may be that it's too deep inside the pelvis or um, it's too large to the point where you would need a massive reconstruction. That would be a reason, but Can never heard of it. Can you talk about the imbrication stitches and how you make the dura more strong? Because All the right, so the surgery the can be done. In, yeah. So the way I do the surgery is to first do it minimally invasively because um, it doesn't take much to cause pelvic symptoms. So you don't want to create a lot of collateral damage. And there's a bunch of different ways to do it, but I simply just open up the dural membrane, break apart all those little kind of thin little walls and septations that become a one-way check valve, um, avoid injuring the little nerve rootlets that are all over the place, and then repair that opening by over sewing it. We call that imbrication. So it would be like, you know, the cuff on your pants. When you sew it, it bunches up. And it's much stronger because everything is kind of squashed together. And then we do a three layer kind of construct where we put like this, it's basically a collagen sponge called Duragen, a little thin layer of a gel that's made out of the clot that we make in our blood called fibrin glue. And you do that in three layers and then you close it up. That way it's biologic, it's minimally invasive. It has very few um, kind of foreign substances that are, uh, non-absorbable, everything's bioabsorbable and, and biologic, um, and try to do the surgery before the cyst gets so large that it's kind of A, too late, and B, too dangerous to do the surgery, because my guess is, is that the high complication rate in tardive cyst surgery is because most tardive cyst surgeries are, are performed at the end stage of the disease. The small number of patients that we've done, we don't wait that long, because Pelvic problems manifest much earlier on. Um, when you become when you become incontinent of urine, it's kind of too late by then. But that's when most heart loss cyst surgeries are pursued when it's so bad that uh, um, the patient's about to become incontinent or so, already incontinent. So can I get back to uh, just quickly uh, back to a previous question about the hypo function? Isn't it the case that if you uh, assess that a uh, herniated disc is pr uh, probably having uh, uh, having the effect that if you uh, uh, do the um, minimally invasive surgery on the herniated disc, it alleviates uh, the hypofunction and, and function can return even after uh, years. Um, isn't that if the, the herniated disc or abnormality is the cause of the hypofunction, our results of our hypofunction patients have still been pretty good. It's just, we have a hard time finding those positive diagnostic response patients. But when they do get a positive diagnostic response, I think our success rate has been 80%. And what is the positive diagnostic response when it's hypofunction? That they, they feel that they have at least a 50% improvement in whatever their symptoms are. And I'll give you an example. Um, let's say you have anhedonia and anorgasmia. It usually takes half an hour to have an orgasm. Now I can have one in 10, 15 minutes. Well, that would be a, a significant diagnostic response. What's the diagnostic test? Um, having an orgasm. No, but I mean, oh, 
but uh, is it uh, giving giving uh, uh, steroid a steroid? Yes. steroid? Yeah, you do a, a targeted injection, but we don't include an anesthetic because there's no anesthetic block. In that situation, the hypothesis is that the inflammation is causing an abnormality in nerve function, and that abnormality just happens to be one that it causes the nerve to act in a hypoactivity state, or it's, you know, it's all abnormal, but some abnormalities make the nerve work less well, and other abnormalities make the nerve work too well. Or and aren't too, you also seeing in, in some cases that the numbness, the hypofunction is preceded a long time earlier uh, by hyperfunction? Yeah, we're looking at that. We've definitely seen that. That's that's Dr. Pomizrak's hypothesis, and he's probably right that the significant number of our patients that present to us with hypofunctioning started out as a hyperactivity disorder and it burned out and just kept going. We see that in, in an entity called a painless foot drop where somebody has a herniated disc, they have severe sciatica and a foot drop, and then the pain gets better, but the foot drop persists. That would be an example. What do you guys think about uh, old technology that's not really used very much anymore? It was specifically used for discogenic back pain called IDET, interdiscal electrothermoplasty, where, you know, I did several hundred of those back in, in the 2000s, where we would coil a wire and the attempt to seal that annular tear by basically heating and melting that posterior third of the annulus. Uh, there's that. And then now newer coming onto the market for discogenic back pain is basovertebral nerve ablation. So mm -hmm. I was just curious what your thoughts were on that and how that might apply um, in this particular case, in these particular cases. I'm really glad you brought that up. The less procedure, the laser endoscopic spine surgery, in many ways is like a really targeted IDET. So the problem with IDET is that it's not targeted. It just goes inside the middle of the disc, it wraps around and you hope that it's the coil is up against the lesion, which ha happens to be more superficial, but you're way deep. Right. Um, but I believe that did. If you do a good job, a lot of patients got better, but it's hard to do that surgery well because it's hard to coil that. I mean, I can just tell from that picture that you sent us earlier, Michael, that you probably got great results with IDET because I can tell you know how to wind a catheter around spaces, but not everybody knows how to do that. That's like being a, like a really good ping pong player. <laughs> you either got it or you don't. Um, there are some so physical. when I do the endoscopic surgery, I'm looking at the lesion and I'm not only doing the IDET, uh, which is a big part of it, I'm also removing any offending agent that started the process to begin with. So um, I almost view the less procedure as a really good IDET procedure. Um, the, the, the basal vertebral nerve thing, I think that's the one where you talk about they go in, into the bone and intraosseous, I believe in that too, because I know the principal investigator, he's a very credible guy, um, but that's still not ready for um, prime time. And that's focused on back pain right. due to discogenic problems. Right. Yeah, I was just curious. Uh, yeah, that's promising. The overlay here that we're talking about. And so down the road, it might actually make sense. At some point. Sue has something to say here. So Dr. Kim, a lot of people are really interested in your tarlexid surgery. You described it before, which was wonderful. Uh, but assuming that you get it early, like you talked about, and you use minimally invasive spine surgery, how long a procedure is that? How many days does the patient stay in the hospital? People are always concerned about the, you know, what the, that big picture looks like. So yeah, but it usually takes me um, two to four hours, depending on how complicated it is, because it's like removing gum from shack carpet. But you, can, but the shag carpet is like a family heirloom, and you cannot injure one fiber of it. <laughs> so it's not a surgery that I enjoy doing very much. Um, so it depends on how sucked in it is. Um, but by doing it with computer navigation, using mill invasive techniques, most patients go home either the same day or the next day. And um, most patients are kind of just walking around and waiting for everything to heal. That healing process usually takes four to six weeks. So I would say that. Uh, um, it's a short hospital stay, but the recovery probably is about a month. Um, but it varies from uh, person to person. It varies from how many cysts you have and how big the cysts are and how durable the repair is. So uh, it's one of those entities that 
um, have a kind of a, a quite a variable course. Although we've been lucky because we've been getting all our tardive cysts relatively small and early on. All our patients are doing really well, but what do you, what do you historically speaking, tardive relative... cyst surgery is not fun. What do you what do you define as relatively small? Like under like two less centimeters. than a centimeter. Less than a centimeter. You know, I, I've, I've dealt with colleagues in the neurosurgical world that just claim tarlof cysts don't cause pain and they don't deal with them. And I've ver been very upset with that over a course of 20 years. So I'm excited to be working with you, Dr. Kim, because I I'm think so glad you said that. People, people, uh, I think the neurosurgeons just don't want to deal with it. Uh, just like I you said, so. the difficult thing, um, you need good hands, you need to have good uh, clinical judgment as to who does better with it and so I'm, I'm just really excited that I, I got to work with you because I have these patients in my practice for years it's like what do I do you know I can do nerve block yeah. and when the nerve block goes away then the pain comes back and you yeah. know it's frustrating for the patients I got somebody to send you she's a physician I'm going to work on doing that so of course somebody uh, just asked uh, what if it's 1.3 centimeters so <laughs> this is exactly why um it depends on the shape, location, and how many, how much bony erosion there is. By the way, there's nerve testing that needs to be done in these patients. That I've been wanting to ask that. So one of the other ways that we achieve a diagnostic, because the key to surgery in my mind is the, the accuracy of the diagnosis. Because you could do the perfect surgery, but if you do it on the wrong situation, you're not going to get a good result. So um, we've been talking a lot about diagnostic injections, but one of the key things that, you know, we start like a funnel of a thousand people and we get down to like 50. That process is not through diagnostic injections. That process starts with doctor, people like Dr. Goldstein, who's doing a, a clinical evaluation. And, and one part of it is a very detailed neuro uh, genital testing thing. So can you talk about that and how you basically take a patient that has a pelvic problem and wind it all the way down to somebody that has a pelvic problem due to a spinal disorder, because most pelvic problems are non-spinal still, right? Yeah, so um, uh, back to the incidental versus it's meaningful. Uh, for someone to say it's incidental, they would have to be showing evidence that the nerve is unaffected by the tarlow cyst. So we do three tests to show that, and they all have to be abnormal. So we do vibration, hot and cold testing of the genital sacral nerve. So we'll place different probes on, on different areas of the genitals, and they cannot perceive it to be appropriately vibratory, appropriately hot, or appropriately cold compared to a finger which is non-genital. Then we place a vibration device called a biothesiometer on the lower extremity, the gluteal area, the back of the thigh, the back of the calf. That's the same sacral area. Uh, sacral innervation, but it has nothing to do with the genital. And these people with Tarlov cysts, where it's not incidental, where it's really bothering them, they will not perceive this vibratory sensation in most regions of the lower extremity. Then we do a test called the bubble cavernosis reflex. So we touch the clitoris and the anus will, will contract. And if that is a delayed response, then the Tarlov cyst is an issue or an annular tear same sort of thing. You, you, some people will look at a, at a uh, high intensity zone area on an MRI and say, oh, I have many of those. This will never cause a problem. But if neurogenital tests are really abnormal, then that would link you to finally getting to the transforaminal or, or uh, epi, you know, epidural injection with either the steroid or the, the lidocaine as appropriate. So minimally invasive neurogenital tests are really paramount and getting you to the highly selected patient that you can figure out. I think that's really important. Yep. Thank you for bringing I, it up. I think that's what's unique too, because you have a sea of patients with pelvic disorders. Only a small percentage of them are due to a spinal problem. How do you find those? If you don't have a quick, effective way to find them, you basically just give up on those patients. And I think that's what's been happening until Dr. Goldstein basically took the exam and made it objective. So instead of just asking and doing some kind of finger testing, he does temperature, vibration. Do you do sharp dull as well? And then all the all the spinal cord reflex sharp testing. Sharp dull is a little, uh, we, 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 so there's uh, A beta fibers, A delta fibers, and C fibers. Those are the sensory nerves. We test specifically the, the, the issues yep. of those three fibers. And this is probably one of the reasons why 
this is the only area of my practice where I collaborate with other doctors like this. <laughs> so we're gonna Everyone else, they just have to just try to keep up. This is one where I'm just, I'm trying to keep up because um, it's so complicated. The question is, how can doctors get more educated on tarlef cysts? And I'm gonna expand that tarlef cyst, Daniel Ortiz, that and other uh, incidental findings in the cauda equina, many doctors still say that they don't cause symptoms. Well, I'm gonna address this and let you know that you just saw a presentation that Dr. Kim gave at the Sexual Medicine Society of North America. We've also presented information at the International Society for the Study of Women's Sexual Health, the American Neurological Association. So it is our job um, to, to do our best to get the information out there. We can't help if physicians don't listen, but your jobs as patients if you know if you become our patients go back to your old doctor your former doctors or you know whatever and explain to them this is what happened our job is not to criticize other clinicians for not knowing how to do this our job yours as patients and ours as providers our job is to make sure we educate more people because it's not their fault they don't know yet we just need to open their eyes excellent point very good point and i think um having these webinars that we can use like, let's say a physician says, I don't know anything about it. Now we can just say, here's a link to a webinar. Here's a link to a presentation. Here's a link to a surgery. Here's a link to, uh, we're about to submit for a peer reviewed publication on, on our experience. So it'll be a peer reviewed publication in a major society journal. Uh, and with one year follow-up. <laughs> yep, with at least one year follow-up. So that will be like the smoking gun that will make it very difficult for people to just brush it aside and also give us an excuse to start really getting out there uh, and telling people about this. Because once I tell my spine colleagues about this and they start peppering me with rotten tomatoes and, and poison darts, I can say this is a peer reviewed publication from a multidisciplinary organization. They looked at it. <laughs> they believe us. You need to start thinking about this. Um, so I've been waiting because I'm too chicken to, you know, stick my neck out there that far. But I am very confident that this is um, a whole new area of, of spine. And in the not too distant future, we will not be having this problem where um, you'll have difficulty finding a spine specialist to help take care of you know, problems like this. Having said that, it is now 404. We're about four minutes behind schedule, we allotted ourselves until 4.15, but we should start thinking about wrapping up. Um, we actually um, have a very good question that somebody asked. Are you concerned with spinal leaks post-surgery? And I think that's something that's on a lot of people's minds. Um, not with the less surgery or lumbar spine surgeries, but with tarlof cyst surgeries, yes. That is probably the biggest complication, second to, um, worsening nerve function when we do tardive cyst surgery. But I would say that that risk is relatively low if you're careful um, and meticulous. Well, Dr. And don't, and, and there's some lesions that are, so, they're so large and just look like are gonna be so risky that it's not worthwhile undertaking. So a combination of patient selection and very meticulous if you've ever seen me in the OR, I mean, I'm just a terrible person. <laughs> Nothing's good enough. I'm just so demanding. But you have to be like that when you're building a ship in a bottle. It has to be perfect. So um, those well, are the two simple strategies. Something for Michael. Uh, uh, we've had patients where Dr. Kim does not think it's an appropriate surgical case who have gotten better with spinal cord stimulators. And I want to put a plug in for that because it's relatively non-invasive and uh, can be extremely helpful. So Michael, tell me your experience with spinal cord stimulators. Can you do that or? Yeah, so um, I've been doing neuromodulation now for 21 years. Oh, wow. Started in the military. It started with a guy who had a torpedo roll over his leg uh, and he had what's called CRPS. He was on 700 milligrams a day of morphine. And anybody on here will tell you that opioids don't work, particularly after 12 weeks. They just don't work. And so this poor guy was suicidal and we did a, an old fashioned dorsal column stimulator and his leg changed colors, went back to normal. He stopped all his drugs. And, uh, you know, that was 20 years ago. And so that actually changed my life. That was one of the reasons I went into this particular branch of pain medicine was specifically for this. And as I said, 
uh, spinal cord stimulation and neuromodulation has taken off in the last 10 years. We have high frequency stimulators. We have different waveforms. We have dorsal root ganglion stimulation now. And so there's, it's a Swiss army knife of options that, that are potentially available to patients. And I think uh, now with the opioid crisis, it has spurred more of a discussion uh, on these sort of non, uh, less invasive sort of approaches. And so I think it's the future. Uh, it definitely has a place in the continuum of care. Thank you. And there's a huge role in the large group of patients where we don't have a specific location, but we know it's coming from the spine somewhere. But there's, well, there's not an easily treatable lesion. Or, or so or I multiple, think uh, spinal cord stimulation is going to be potentially really a, an important part of our whole program. Michael, I'm going to love working with you. I can see it already. <laughs> Likewise. All right. Great group. So let's close um, in the interest of time. Um, after the webinar, uh, by the way, it'll be recorded and it'll be on YouTube, plus it's on Facebook being recorded live, so it'll be there. And then um, we'll send out a follow-up email to anybody that wants, all the attendees and registrants. Um, um, and we'll try to answer the questions that we couldn't answer, um, but no promises. Um, and we'll also be able to kind of give you information on um, uh, if you need to reach one of us, if you have any specific questions directed specifically to you, uh, we can use email uh, to continue this conversation after the fact. So uh, let's all stay in touch. And thank you, Dr. Bertolin. And thank you to my San Diego spine sexual medicine team, Dr. Goldstein, Dr. Komizarek, and Sue Goldstein. Lana is sitting right there. Hey, Lana, thank you. If you saw me leaning over, she's the one telling me, stop talking, turn this off, turn that off. You're not doing <laughs> So um, thank you to Lana as well. Um, I look forward to seeing you all again, probably in about another month or so for our next webinar. Thank you all. Be safe, everyone. Bye now.